uh, the sermon today. We've been in a series we started last week called Occupations. How many of you guys were here last week and enjoyed that message? Was it an awesome message? Well, if you weren't, I just encourage you, go online, check out the message called The Athlete. In light of the Super Bowl, we were talking about athletics and how that relates to the Word of God. And it was such a good message, and I believe that people were touched by it. We're just going to talk about the next occupation in this series today. And today, we're going to be talking about the businessman. The businessman. Look at this guy. Oh, so fresh and so clean. And that little smile on his face. He's making money. You know, he's all excited about life because he's doing business. He's doing work. He's the businessman. That's who we're going to talk about today. And the, the scripture verse that we're looking at here uh, in this series is Luke chapter 19, verse 13. Luke chapter 9, verse 19, verse 13. Now the Bible says, Jesus is talking in the scripture, he says, occupy until I come. The context of the scripture is Jesus is actually telling a businessman of the day named Zacchaeus, he's telling him this parable about another nobleman or another businessman. And as Jesus is talking about this parable, he's telling Zacchaeus and some of his other disciples that there was this nobleman who had ten servants, so he had ten employees. And, and this nobleman was looking to um, extend his business and, you know, go beyond his business. And he wanted to go and buy some land in another place so he could make more money, so he could be happy like this businessman right up here. And so he tells his ten servants, he says, hey, guys. I'm going away, and I need you guys to occupy until I come. Now, this is a great reference to what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He rose again from the dead, and then the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible also says he's coming back again. But until he comes back, he's telling his church to occupy until he comes. Now, this parable that Jesus was talking about, the businessman, after he left and he went and he bought that other land, he came back to see what his servants did with the money that he gave them. Yeah. And as he saw, two of those servants multiplied that money that he gave them, but one of them didn't. And that's a really good story. I encourage you guys to read it, Luke chapter 19, when you get home. But one of the other uh, versions of the Bible, the King James is occupied until I come, but I read another version of the, uh, the Bible this week, of this scripture, it actually says, do business until I come. Listen to me, church. God has business for you and for me. I want you to turn to, to, in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be talking about the businessman today, and we're going to look at three things about the businessman's business. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of business, and please don't tell pastor it's none of your business, because I'm going to get up in your business, because we're talking about business today, Okay. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2. If you have your Bible, turn with me. If you don't have your Bible, please bring your Bible to church. That way you know that the pastor is telling you the truth. W. I tell people this all the time because if I'm not preaching out of this, don't listen to me. But if I am preaching and teaching out of this, the Bible says that this word is truth. And when that truth gets in your life, it will keep you free and it will set you free. So then we're looking to be more free. We're looking at what God is talking about regarding the businessman. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Look at the, what the Bible says. Follow along with me. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of what? Works. Lest anyone should boast. Now let me stop right there before we read verse 10. I want to be very clear at the beginning of this series. Because throughout this series, we're going to be talking about a lot of works. We're going to be talking about a lot of business today. But I want you guys to know that those works and our business is not what gets us to heaven, okay? Last week, we talked about when we do get to heaven that Jesus is going to judge us uh, by our works as a Christian, but he's not going to send us to hell if we didn't do those works. I want to be very clear on this. The only way that you and I get to heaven is by the grace of God that was demonstrated at the cross of Christ. Amen. When Jesus hung and died on that cross and he shed his blood for you, that was God's grace given to humanity saying, this is sufficient for you. The Bible says his grace is sufficient for you. When he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. Yeah. That means the price that it took to get to us to heaven was paid That's for right. you and me. And it was paid in full. So we're not saved by works. I, I want to make this very clear because we're going to be talking about a lot of works. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But look at verse 10. It says, but we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Yeah. Another way 
going to say that is to do business. We are created. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do business. To do his business. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Today we're talking about three things about the businessman's business. Let me jump right into the word of God. Are you guys excited about this message today? Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm preaching to happy people ready to hear the word of God. The first thing about the businessman's business is that it's a family business. It's a family business. Okay, look, Jesus, when he was on the earth, when he was 12 years old, he had the revelation about this business that I'm talking about. He recognized that it was his father's business. He was 12 years old. He was at the temple hanging out, talking to, to the leaders, and somehow uh, he you know, hid himself from his parents. The parents go with their journey. They're walking back to where they were going, and, and they're headed back to their hometown from Jerusalem, and all of a sudden they look around, and they're like, hey. Where's my 12-year-old Jesus? And then, you know, Mary's starting to get real upset and worried because, you know, she, this is her precious. This is like her favorite son, you know what I mean? How many parents can say, yeah, I have one of those. Don't say that, please. But this is their, their favorite son, and all of a sudden, I mean, he's nowhere to be found. And so they're like, oh, my gosh, we left him in Jerusalem. Have you guys ever left? Don't, okay, don't raise your hand on that one. Yeah. So they go back to Jerusalem, back to the temple. They come and they find Jesus. He's like teaching the leaders of the church at that time, or the leaders of the synagogue and, and, and the temple. And he's talking to them, teaching them, preaching to them at 12 years old. And then they're like, hey, uh, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, don't you know that we're like worried, sick about you? You know what Jesus said? He says, I got to be about my father's business. Listen, this business is a family business, and we got a godfather, okay? Amen. He's the godfather, and he has business for us to do. Uh, hopefully you guys haven't watched the godfather movies, but if you did, then you kind of understand what I'm talking about. Hey, that was pre-Jesus days. But it's a family business. Ephesians 2.10, it says we are his workmanship. It doesn't say one pastor is his workmanship. It doesn't just say the evangelists or the CEOs of the church. It says we are his workmanship created in Christ to do good works. That means we all have a part to play in this family business. We're a part of God's family, and he has business for you and I to do. You say, well, Pastor, what's this business all about? Well, I'm really glad that you asked today, because I'm going to tell you what this business is all about. The number one thing that God wants you and I to do as a Christian, you and I to do as God's businessmen and God's businesswomen, is to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I preach a lot about this because this is the number one thing that the church is supposed to do. The reason why Diversity Church exists is, is because of souls. We're here to get people off of this sinking ship and, and, and introduce them to their Savior, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Look here at John chapter 6, verse 29. I'm going to show you what this work is all about, what this business is all about, what this family business consists of. John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. Now stop right there. That means whatever's coming after this is the work of God. So we're going to find out what God's business is all about, okay? He has a family business. He's the Godfather. He runs this show. Jesus said, i got to be about my father's business. What is it? That you would believe in him whom he has sent. Who is him? Who is it? Jesus is actually talking about himself. He's saying, you know, you want to know what the work of God is? You want to know what the business of God is all about? It's all about getting people to believe in Jesus Christ. That's the business. So we all come in, into the family of God when we first believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's how we're uh, engrafted, the Bible says, into the family of God. But guess what? If you're a part of his family, then... You're a part of this business of telling other people about Jesus. Amen. Look here in Romans chapter 10. This is some awesome teaching for a moment. I want you guys to get a hold of this because this shows you that you have purpose. You have work to do. And it's more than just your occupation or your job. If you're a carpenter or a fireman or a policeman or a real estate agent or a drywall dude, you know, this is more than that, okay? Romans 10, 14, it says... How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Okay, what is the work of God? What is the business of God? For people to believe, right? Believe in Jesus. 
He says, well, how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Now check this out. And how shall they believe? Again, how shall they get this business in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, God has business for us to do, and it's for each and every one of us to do our part to tell somebody that doesn't know about Jesus, that is lost and dying in their sins. God has said, listen, I have set my church as my businessmen and businesswomen, and I need them to go and do my business, which is to tell people about Jesus. Now, this word preacher doesn't mean just a preacher behind a pulpit like this. Trust me, church, there is way more people in the world than what I can preach to my own self. There are so many more people in this community than I can reach my own self. This is a family business because we all need to do our part to do the ultimate goal, which is to tell everybody about Jesus from every nation, from every tribe, and every tongue. And then the Bible says Jesus will come back. That's a prophecy that he gave in Matthew chapter 24. He says, I'm not coming back until every nation hears about me. Well, if we want Jesus to come back, then guess what? We got work to do. We got business to do, and and we all are his preacher. It doesn't mean you have to preach from the Bible. It doesn't mean you have to preach from a pulpit. But you are to open up your mouth and tell somebody. You are to, to speak and let somebody know. Let me just tell you this, this community that we're in right here at Diversity Church, the Garfield Park area, north, south, east, and west of the park, there are so many people that may have never heard of Jesus in the first place. You say, what? Well, they might have heard of him, but they haven't heard the good news about him, what he did at that cross, what he did when he rose again from the dead, what he's doing when he's going to come back again. There's so many people that have never even heard. You know, if you look at our vision video at, uh, on www.diversitychurchindy.org and you watch our vision video, there was a young man that I had the, the pleasure of speaking to about Jesus. He's 14 years old, dropped out of high school, kind of lived in the streets, gang banging with his brother. We're right here about a half a mile down the road. This, uh, this young guy, as we were talking and as I was sharing the gospel with him, he had never heard about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for his sin. You think, man, this is the United States of America. We got Christian TV. We got all these other things. Well, guess what? Many non-Christians or most non-Christians don't watch Christian TV, okay? Many non-Christians, they don't like coming to church because they're kind of afraid of it or concerned with it. Or maybe they've been burnt by it in the past. Well, this young guy, he had never heard about the gospel of Jesus. And he's right here in our backyard. There's other people like him. Maybe other people that have some bad occupations. Maybe some drug dealers. Maybe, you know, some prostitutes, maybe some thieves. You know, that's what they're doing for a living. Right here in our own backyard. Well, how are they going to hear about this Jesus and believe in this Jesus unless you and I go to where they're at and tell them about this Jesus? You know, a lot of people think, well, I'll just live a good life. Maybe you feel this way at your workplace. And we're talking about occupations and, you know, maybe, you, you know, you're at a your workplace, and you're trying to figure out how can I tell somebody about this Jesus? How can I make a way? And you're thinking, well, I'll just show them my good actions and my good deeds, and, and that'll get them to Christ. <laughs> well, my Bible says, how are they going to believe unless they hear? Yeah. Your good actions and your good works, yes, they might be a good example, and I think we should do that. That's not telling them about Christ yeah. and what he right. did for them. We have to open up our mouth. And there's so many people that this family business is going to take each and every one of us doing our part. Now, here at Diversity Church, as the weather's starting to warm up, no, it's not. We got snow this morning. But it will warm up. Spring is coming, hallelujah. And it's going to get nice out, and we're all looking forward to that. But as it does, and I'm hoping by the end of next month, at the end of March, for us to start these community outreaches that we're going to be doing called Apartment Crusades. We're going to go into these communities. We're going to learn some dramas like we uh, advertised or talked about in the an- announcements last week. We're going to learn these dramas. We're going to bring a grill. We're going to grill some food. We're going to invite everybody the night or the week before to come out on this one Saturday afternoon. And we're going to just have a, a little apartment crusade. We're going to have dramas and 
food and music, and then I'm going to share a short word, and then we're going to invite them to church. I want everybody to get involved in one of these. Hopefully, we're going to do them from March all the way to August, so once a month. From March to August, we're going to be doing these crusades, and I don't want to limit to that to that. I mean, we need to be a church of outreach. Why? The number one business for this church, for Diversity Church, and should be the number one business of the body of Christ, is to tell people about Jesus Christ. Amen. Am I making it pretty clear today? Is the Bible very clear about what God's business is all about? His business is soul business, and this is the family business that means every one of us have to be about our father's business, which is to tell people about him. Let me go to the second point in the message. Oh, we got to give them an offer that they can't refuse. Let me go to the second point. There's no business like this business. There's no business like this business. Now, Hollywood, you guys have all heard the phrase. What do they say? There's no business like show business, right? Well, show business is a pretty cool business. If you're all about, you know, trying to make some money and fame and fortune, you know, that fame, that fortune, that glamour, it'll last for a moment. But why don't we think for a moment about Philip Seymour Hoffman, who died just this last week. Very well-known actor in a lot of movies. They found him in his hotel room with uh, a needle in his arm. And he, they said uh, that he overdosed on heroin. Died right there. He was all about the business of Hollywood. Very well-known actor, very well-paid actor. He lived in a penthouse suite in New York somewhere. I mean, that was a pretty cool business, but guess what? The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? That's right. You can be the most successful businessman in all the world. You're talking about Donald Trump status, Bill Gates status. You can be, you know, the 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 uh, you know producer in Hollywood like a Tom Hanks, you know, or, or one of those big guys in Hollywood. But if the Bible the Bible says if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, what what does it profit you? What profit was that? Now businesses are all about profit, right? They're all about the bottom dollar. They're all about the riches. It's, it's, it's all about getting the business, the work done. Well, if we just think about the businesses here on the, on the earth and we think about show business, none of those businesses compare to this family business, God's business. That's right. Why? Because God's business, leading people into an eternal salvation, that lasts forever. It's not just something that's going to burn away. The Bible says, you know, we were born naked and we're going to leave this world naked. We can't take any of the treasures of this life with us to the next life. But the Bible does tell us we can take something and that is souls of men and women that we are able to bring to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's something that we can do. So no matter what we do for a living here on earth. No matter, you know, if you're a manager of a store or you're a, a DJ or a disc jockey, it does not matter if you're not winning souls. Because that's the only thing that is going to last for eternity. That is why the, there's no business like this business. You know what else? I've thought of this many times. I wonder, God, okay. Obviously, there's a lot of people that need to be saved. You know, there's a lot of people that need to be told. Why didn't you, Jesus, just stay on the earth after you died, after you rose again, and just tell people yourself? Like, why didn't you just do the work for us? Like, why couldn't you have just done this business, just stood in Jerusalem, broadcasted it? Maybe you just show up in a vision to people, you know, and just say, hey, I'm Jesus, believe on me, you know? Like, wh why didn't you do that? Why did you give it, the church this business to take care of? And as I asked that question and I thought about it, I realized because God wanted us to have the reward and the privilege and to experience what it's like to bring salvation to somebody. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of telling somebody about Jesus and then believing in him after you told him, there's no business like it. Amen. Now, I've made, you know, some money in my life. I've had some success in my life. Um, you know, I, I, not as much as like a Bill Gates or this Philip Seymour Hoffman guy. But I'm telling you, the most joyous moments <laughs> of my 
my life, of my ministry, is when somebody accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior because I told them about him. When you think about that, and you think about when we get to heaven, and there's so many people that I know I've told about Christ just in passing on the streets or in a big crusade in Brazil or whatever. I can't wait till I get to heaven and somebody's going to come up to me and say, Pastor Jonathan or Jonathan, I'm here because of you. I would have never been here if you would have told me about this Jesus. But now I get to experience this life and this freedom and this peace and this joy and this loving God because you opened up your mouth and you told me about him. Wow, there's no business like that. You're talking about profit that is lasting for eternity. The Bible says don't lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust is going to corrupt. And thieves come and break in and they steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We talked about the crown of soul winning last week where Jesus is, is going to give us a crown if we were faithful witnesses. But more important than that are those people that are going to come to us. And I'm praying that there's hundreds in heaven because of me. Because, in part because of me, obviously, you know, the Holy Spirit has to do his work, but we're co-laborers with Christ. This is a, a business partnership with Jesus. And we have a work to do too. And so in part because I told them about this Lord and Savior Jesus. And not just when I get to heaven. But if you've led somebody to Christ and they've accepted Christ in your presence, you've prayed with them. Man, some of the most joyful moments in my life have been praying with somebody to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, let me just tell you the story about a guy named Kevin. Uh, last year, I was um, I came home from the mission field, and my wife and I were thinking about what we're going to do next. So this is before Diversity Church was even fully envisioned in our hearts, and so we um, decided to get licensed with the Assembly of God. And I had to take some classes in order to get prepared to. Um, to start this church. And so we were going through that process and I wanted to make a little money on the side. So UPS, they were hiring, you know, some part-time driver helpers during the Christmas season. They do that because of all the gifts that we buy every Christmas, you know, through the eBay or whatever else. And so they have all sorts of uh, more packages. So they need to hire some part-time help. So I decided to apply and I'm on the truck with this guy named Kevin. And every day we're driving through the neighborhoods, delivering packages, and I show up on time. You know, I, I want to be a good example. So I show up on time, I work hard, you know, I'm taking this very serious, but, you know, every um, time we're in that car, I'm just, you know, talking to him about the things of God. He's asking me questions. Every lunch we stopped and we ate somewhere and he paid for my lunch. He's asking me questions. I pray for our lunch together. He's asking me questions. He never even really heard the gospel like I'm telling you today. He never really heard anything like that before. And so after about two, about a month and a half towards the end of my time there at UPS, on this truck with him, he says, Jonathan, what do I need to do to get saved? I love that question. I love that question. Because it's so simple. I said, the Bible says you just need to turn from your sinful life and look to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And when you believe on him, the Bible says you confess him with your mouth, you'll be saved. It's that simple. Romans 10. You can read the whole chapter. It's, talk, it's all about talking about salvation. And so I said that to him. And I said, you know what? You can do that at home tonight if you're more comfortable doing that. Or you know, if you want, we can pray right here on the truck. You know, whatever you want to do. You know, I just leave it in, you know, put the ball in his court. Well, he says, Jonathan, I want that. I said, you want it right now? He said, yeah. So we got up. We went to the back of the truck. In the UPS truck. <laughs> Come on, this is God's business. Yeah. doesn't matter where it's at. It could be a UPS truck. It could be a building like this. It could be in your bedroom at home. It's God's business. It's believing in Christ. So we go right there to the back of the truck. <gasps> and I just let him in a prayer of salvation. I put my right hand on him. And I remember it's my right hand because of what he said after. I put my right hand on him. He prayed this prayer of salvation. When he prayed it, I mean, you could just tell God was moving in his heart. I prayed for him afterwards. We opened our eyes. It was a dreary day, kind of dark, gloomy, kind of rainy. He looks out and he said, man, everything's been broken.
bright. That gets brighter. Jesus, did you feel that? I was like, feel what? I was like, man, I felt like the truck was shaking. You know, he just had this moment with God, and it was powerful for him. And I remember he told me the next day, um, he went home, and he told his son about it, and he prayed a prayer with his son, you know. He's all excited. He wants to get everybody saved now, you know. He believed. Now he's a part of God's business, right? So he comes back, and he said, man, but I laid my hand on my son, but I said, do you feel it? The son was like, no, I what are you talking about? I don't feel it. He was like, well, you need Jonathan to put his hand on you. Because, man, when he laid his hand on me, I felt all sorts of warmth and power. I mean, it was just so cool to see. Just, he, he'd never really been in church, nothing like that, but just believed in Jesus from his heart. And that moment, and just hearing about that, and just seeing that experience, man, it makes it all worth it. Amen. There's no business like this business. God wants all of us to do our part. Let me talk to you about the third and final point of the message today. This business is full of appointments. This business is full of appointments. God has a calendar for you and me. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 10, it says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has what? Before ordained. Before ordained that we should walk in them. That means he's ordered them. He, he's put them on the schedule. He's put them, you know, even before, when we were in our mother's womb. It's like he saw our days. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So that as his business people, as his business men and women, he has appointments for us throughout our days. And we have to be aware of this because he's going to put people in your path to talk to them about Christ. He has these appointments, not just to talk to them about Christ. Maybe he'll put somebody in your path that, that needs to help you with the ministry that he's calling you to do. I can testify to you today of this, that my walk with Jesus has been full of these divine appointments. My walk with Jesus has been full of, of moments where I was just being about God's business. And then God said, I'm all about your business. See, when we put him first, and we're about his business, and we're looking at our schedule, and we're saying, God, I'm going to fit you into this schedule. In the morning, I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to get my orders from headquarters. I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to talk to my Godfather, and I'm going to figure out what he wants me to do today. You know, if we live our life that way, if we make room for God in our schedules, God's going to make room for us. I'm telling you, he will give you divine appointment after divine appointment. The reason why I'm married to my lovely wife is because I was doing God's business on the streets of Indianapolis, and her dad was down there doing the same thing and introduced us together. I'm telling you, when you go about seeking God's business first, I got some single people in here ready to listen now. They're like, okay. I just tell people about Jesus and he's going to bring me my spouse. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, if you go do what God tells us to do first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything you have need of. God knows you need a spouse. God sees your heart. He knows everything that you want. And he's just waiting for the right time. And he's waiting to where he can trust you with that thing. He knows he can trust you if you're about his business. Because you're saying, Jesus, you're first place in my life. And I give you everything. I'm telling you, I've done that. And God has given me divine appointments on airplanes, on streets, uh, you know, in coffee shops, at my workplace. You know, everywhere I go, I'm always constantly meeting somebody that I know God is, uh, specifically put in my life for a reason. I'm telling you, these meetings are amazing, and uh, it, it, it's just being about his business. I remember when I was uh, about 19 or 20, shortly after I got saved, I was um, going to visit some friends in southern Indiana. And I, I want to tell you this story because I don't want you to think that it's only pastors and really spiritual people that can have these divine appointments. I want you to know this is you. So this is before I ever had the title of a pastor. This is before I ever even got paid any money at all to do any ministry at all. Before it was my job. Before it was my occupation. I was about 18, 19. I was in the car. We were driving to southern Indiana. We were on I-70 um, towards Terre Haute. All of a sudden, the cars just immediately stopped. I mean, just a complete standstill on I-70. So we're sitting in there, and me and my buddy were talking, 
you know, kind of just joking, laughing, having a good time. And all of a sudden, I got this little disturbing in my heart to get out of the car and to go talk to somebody about Jesus. <laughs> I'm on the interstate. <laughs> There's three, you know, uh, lines of traffic. Everyone stopped. I mean, where did this thought come from? Well, I thought about it for a second. I said, I'm not getting out of this car and going to talk. I said, what am I going to say? I'm going to knock on the window. Hey, you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You know? like, what am I going to do? Like, so I'm just sitting here arguing, just trying to think, of, is this God? And then I thought a little bit more about it. Like, why else would I have had this thought to get out of my car and go tell somebody about Jesus? And that's really important. I want you guys to remember this. God will direct your steps. God does have specific things for your life, specific people for your life. He will speak to you, and it's a still, small voice. And we have, to, we have to spend time with God through reading the Bible and praying daily so that we're used to that voice, so that when we hear that voice, we can obey that voice. Does that make sense to everybody? We've got to get our orders from headquarters, like that Charlie Angel, you know, that little, you know... Voice that just comes up. They knew who that voice was. You know what I'm saying? They're like, okay, we got we got some business to do. Well, we got to get used to the voice of God, so that when He tells us about a divine appointment, we're ready to follow. And so as I was there, and I was like, Man, this has to be God, because I'm not going to think about this my own self. So I had some gospel tracks. They're million dollar bills. They have a little message about Jesus on the back. And so I get out, and I'm like nervous, thinking, oh man, I don't know who I'm supposed to go to, but God must have somebody to talk to. And so I knocked on doors, and people were looking at me strange. I gave them a gospel track. and I said, God bless you. You know, have a good day. And I'm just, I'm just trying to look for who? Okay, God, who are you bringing me to? Where is this divine appointment? There has to be somebody. I go to about two or three or four cars. After uh, the third or fourth car, I look, and there's this young guy. He was standing outside of his car as well, just kind of hanging out, getting some fresh air. We weren't going to move for a while, it seems. And I look at him, and I say, hey, man, uh, I want to give you this gospel track. It talks to you about Jesus. And I said, do you have a Christian background? He was like, well, you know, I grew up Catholic, but I don't really go to the ch church. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really you know, follow it or anything. So we just got in a conversation. I just shared with him this message of Christ and the good news about what Jesus did for me. As we were talking, um, you could just tell every word that I was sharing with this young man. And, you know, it's like he was grabbing a hold of. You know, light was just, you know, you could just tell light was coming on his head. He was starting to see something he had never seen before. As I finished telling him the gospel, the moment I was basically saying amen, the moment I got done, cars started to turn back on and the traffic started to move. At that moment, I said, okay, God, this was the person I was supposed to go to. This was the, spur the person I was supposed to tell. God had the divine appointment for me right there on the interstate. I thought, man, okay, God, I want to be about your business, man. This is pretty cool stuff. Got back in the car, and I didn't get to pray with him or anything to receive Christ, but I hope one day when I get to heaven that I'm going to see that guy again, and that he's going to come to me and say, Jonathan, I'm here in part because of you. Man, this is God's business. You're his businessman. You're his businesswoman. How about the next time something unexpected happens in your life? If you're following Jesus... You're spending time with him every day and you're walking his path. Instead of complaining about the traffic or instead of complaining about this thing that is coming your way, why don't you take a moment out of your schedule, out of your own little vision and say, God, what is it that you have for me? Is there a divine appointment for me? Is there somebody that you have for me to speak to? Is there somebody that you're putting in my path? I'm telling you, if you do so, God's going to bring you to divine appointment. After divine appointment, and you're going to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Why don't you just bow your heads and close your eyes?